I don't know if you've been to the kind of churches I've been to, but um, like a lot of times where you, you turn around and you take note, you know, of who's not here so that you can like give them the, like the Christian stink eye next week, you know? So, but that's not what we're going to do. But do, do this. Turn around and notice who's not here because those people could invite you to their lake place, okay? Like you got to start, you got to start building some relationships with those people who aren't here, okay? And be like, hey, I love to jet ski, you know, just saying. Like, I don't, do you know anyone who has a speedboat? You know, like, that would be good. So just make note of that stuff. So I'm going to start making a list. All right, so hey, I'm glad you're here. I know that if you're here for the first time, you probably got some questions about the group of people around you. Um, a lot of people do, don't worry. But let me, just, um, let me just kind of set your mind at ease. This is not a group of people who used to be people like you, okay? We're not a group of people who try to change or fix people like you, and we're not here to tolerate you. We don't, we're not here just to put up with you. We love you. We're thrilled that you're here. We're just a group of people just like you, trying to figure out how to take our next step toward Jesus. We mess this stuff up all the time. We don't really know how to do this. It's messy. It's not simple. We work at it, and it's always something we're kind of ebbing and flowing with, but we do our very best to be authentic and real. And every person in this room has parts of our story that we wish we could go back and edit or delete, you know? Like sometimes we just want to go back and hit the delete button and forget it ever happened. Everyone in this room is like that. And so we've all got broken places in our story. We're just trying to figure out what's next. So to do that, we did this series over the last few weeks called United. And um, to kind of give you a little bit of back for, backstory, our church was gracious enough to offer Sheila and I a month of, of time away from ministry with our family and just being able to kind of rest and recuperate and find restoration and really be able to pursue what God was doing in our lives and just kind of sort through all of just kind of working through ministry for 25 years now. And so we took a month, a whole month of July off, no ministry contact. We were able to just kind of unplug completely, no Facebook for us. It was just kind of crazy. Um, crazy time has actually been a little bit difficult to reenter. Um, during that month, I, I spent a lot of time with God just kind of sorting through the book of Colossians, not because I wanted to teach on it. I wasn't really preparing for anything. I was just wanting to study a book. I just wanted to care about it. I spent a lot of time looking up really nerdy stuff that you will never hear about because it's just, it's just nerdy Bible stuff, and I love it. It's fun to read and understand and think about, but it doesn't, it's not one of those things you got to know, you know, but I just enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was good to read through it. Read through it dozens and dozens of times, not because I'm some Bible scholar, but because it only has four chapters, so it's super easy, and you're like, oh, that's cool. You could read through it in like, like, you know, like 20, 30 minutes. You could read through all four chapters, and you know, if you got a King James Bible, you could read through it in like maybe an hour and a half. You know, like, it wouldn't take you hardly at all. You got to figure out the these and nows. That's on you, though. So, um, but, man, I love it. It was such a great book. And I, when I came back, like, the last week of, of time off, I came, I, I sent a text message to Bryce. And I'm like, Bryce, I want to talk to you about this next series that we're going to do. And he's like, no, I think we ought to honor the time off. You just need to take time. We'll just wing it when you come back. It'll be okay. And I came back, and I'm like, okay, fine. We're ready now. I've been thinking about it anyway, so it didn't matter. But, like, you know, but man, we're ready. I want to do the series. I want to call it, like, Together, United, We, Us. I don't care what we call it, but I want to do something like this. I told him, and he was like, man, this is, this is what we'll do. And put it together. And so, man, I just wanted to share a few verses of what God's kind of sharing through in my time off some time and, and what this book of Colossians is all about. And I don't know if you noticed this, but we snuck this in on you. We've been studying the whole book of Colossians for the last four weeks. You didn't know that, did you? Like, this is what the book of Colossians is all about. It's about us being together, about us being united. And it's something that is pretty powerful stuff. So I kind of picked a, a couple of three verses, five verses or so, out of each of the chapters that kind of summarize that chapter and help us kind of bring that stuff to the surface. Not because it's great just to understand that stuff, but because God has an objective that he's been at since he wrote this book through Paul to the church at Colossae, to the same thing that he wrote, like he wrote it to us so that you and I could understand it. And I'm not talking about that some vague sense. When I happened to pick this book out to study while I was off, I had no, no clue that this was what God was going to do next. But I was like, man, this is what God's calling us to. We've got to understand this. We've got to get together on this. We've got to be united. It was a fresh idea, fresh just kind of word from God about stuff powerful stuff. So we open it up in chapter one, and I don't normally do reviews, like where we go back to snapshot every week. I'm not going to re-preach three messages in the next, you know, little bit. But in, I, I said, I was going to say half an hour, but you know, your second service, we get out an hour from now if you want. But 
don't worry, you'll still beat the Baptist to lunch. Okay, so here's the deal. So chapter one, he says this in verse 15. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this one off of the screen because it's different than the translation here because I think it's so powerful in the, in the NIV. And it says, he is the image of the invisible God. He's talking about Jesus. He is the firstborn over all creation. This is huge. For by him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. They were all created. He goes back to say it again. All things were created by him, And what are the next two words? And good job. You guys are really good at that stuff. Now, I I know that, like, I'm not, I'm not an English person, right? In English, I don't do good at, look, I went to Christian school, okay? Like, so, like, so, like, I'm not big on this whole thing, but I, this preposition stuff, we're doing a whole series in a couple weeks called the preposition of proposition. It's, I think it's over Christmas, but uh, it's such, it's going to be good stuff because th- these things are powerful words for, by him and for him, tell us some very important information. In fact, if you only understood four words out of the whole Bible, pick these four. You were created by him and for him. If you, if you said, you know what, I don't have time for all the rest of it, I'm gonna pick four words, pick by him and for him out of Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16, because you understand two things that are vital about you. You were created by God's hand and for God's glory. You were created by him and for him. From that sentence, you can go, okay, I'm created for God. How is it that I'm, how can I pursue God? How can I be more like him? How can I be more? If you only understood four words, take those four, by him, And for him, you and I are united in our authority. God brought us together, us, not some concept concept of us, not just us in general. He brought us together, journey churches together under the authority of Jesus Christ. That's powerful stuff. So we have this umbrella, literally, an umbrella hanging over us, right? Protecting us. This is our authority. We're created by God's hand and for God's glory. It's powerful stuff. Chapter 2. Flip it over. We wind up in chapter 2 in, the, in verse 11. And it says, it says that when you, were, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, cutting away your sinful nature. Now, I want to I just kind of land here, not on the circumcision, because that would be painful. But like, so come on, you guys, people are going to have to lighten up a little, okay? But like, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago when I brought this up, and I could see all the guys squirming, then I brought it up again a little bit last week, everybody squirmed a little more. But this circumcision thing is a big deal, okay? I went, I told you about going to the hospital yesterday, they had a little baby boy, right? And he was a little uncomfortable because they just did the cigar cutter trick, you know, like, and so they just got it out, and they, but you know, he's young enough, he's only like, you know, 20 hours old, he's not going to remember it. But he's not comfortable today, right? He's not, you're not, this is a very tender time, you know? Like, it's painful on him. It's painful for us. All of us, guys, like, can I get an amen? It's a little awkward, you know? A little awkward, a little painful, a little, little sensitive, right? Because what happens here is so important for us to understand. God wants people at this point, like he'd called the Hebrews, to be circumcised not because it was cool, not because turtlenecks weren't in fashion, but because he's like, seriously, you have to lighten up. But like, not because of that, but because this is the center place, right? This is the place where all the infection, all the, all the germs kind of collect, and this, this can be a very unsanitary place if it's not cared for correctly. And I think God knew in the front, I mean, this is just me, this is the Jeremy unauthorized version, that he gave it to men, and we probably wouldn't care. We're like, I don't know, it'll be all right. You know, so we just kind of wing it. So he says, cut that thing off because that thing is where all the, all, the, all the bacteria can get hidden and that can be a really, really bad thing. And so understand something. What we get here is a picture of us removing the thing that is the nature or the centerpiece of all of the infection that could happen in that area. And what he's telling us here is that when you came to Christ, you were spiritually circumcised, that God did a spiritual surgery instead of a physical surgery, and instead of removing the physical part of you that was prone to infection, he removed the spiritual part of you that was prone to infection. That's powerful stuff. Because he says, what he says is that you were circumcised, not by a physical procedure, but Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. He cut away your nature of sinfulness. My kids love kid movies, like little kid movies, okay? Now, my kids are not kid, little kids anymore, right? They're like 
I don't know, teenagers, somewhere in there, like 13, 16, and 18. Is that right? Did I get that right? Okay. So, um, like, so I'm thinking that's about right, give or take. So, but they love little kid movies. Like, it's nothing. My kids want to watch Monsters, Inc., or they want to, they're talking about, like, Despicable Me or things that are for kids. But they, my, one of my daughters loves the, the movie The Lorax, okay? And I, it's a fun movie. I don't know if you've ever seen The Lorax. The, it's a, what's that guy's name? Dr. Seuss. So it's Dr. Seuss story. But there's this great thing. The Lorax protects all the trees. And this guy goes up to him and he says, the Lorax is protecting. He says, you know what? He asks this guy who's kind of, kind of getting away, kind of doing the wrong thing. He says, you know which way a tree falls? It's the best part of the whole movie. Kind of quiets down and it centers in Danny DeVito, right? And he says, a tree falls the way it leans. And I'm like, dang, that'll preach, right? Like, that's good stuff. A tree falls the way it leans, you know? Because we're born into a nature that's bent away from God. And with, with our sinful nature fully intact, we're bent away from God and we fall away from God. But when he says, when we follow Jesus, our spiritual, our, our spiritual surgery cut away our sinful, you see what shape I'm making, right? Like cut away our sinful nature and he released us from the tendency to fall away from God. And he gave us the freedom to make choices to follow him again. He knew that we were enslaved to sin and we didn't really have an option to follow him. Apart from Jesus, we don't have the capacity to do good. When Jesus comes to us, he cuts away our sinful nature and our nature is exposed that we could follow him. We are united, not just under the authority of Jesus, we're united under the freedom that God gives us, that we're no longer bound to sin. We're free from it and we can walk and express unbelievable joy and love for God because he's cut away the thing that leans us away from him. It's a powerful, powerful story, but it's so much bigger than that. Because he says you're united in authority, you're united under freedom. And then he goes to chapter 3, which also made us uncomfortable last week when we kind of walked through some of this. Because 3, 12, and 13 kind of sum it up best. Since God chose you, remember, he circumcised you. He entered into this relationship. He set you free. He says, since God has uh, chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience making room for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. That's some tough stuff. It's tall order, isn't it? That we should have this place because of what God's done. So since he chose you, that you should have, you should clothe yourself with love. He says we should put, our, put on tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness. Those are big deals, patience. You know what's a tragedy? You know what's jacked up beyond all jacked upness, whatever that is, right? You know what's crazy? is the people of God who are united under the authority of Jesus, under the freedom that he provides through this, like setting us free of our, of our spiritual bent away from him, the people who should be defined by love are the most unloving people ever. Isn't it absolutely just, I'm trying, this is crazy. Isn't it insane to you as you, as you consider it? that the people who've been loved so much can sometimes be the worst at loving people, that you're more likely to find unconditional love in a bar or in a place where, in a, in a terrible environment, than you are to find it on a Sunday morning in chairs in a church. It's terrible that that's the way it is. But you and I are united. This is what I mean. When I was reading this, I'm like, if we get this, you want to talk about being crazy valuable to the kingdom. I mean, not just if I get it, not just if you get it, but if we get it, it's a big deal because God's calling us to do something crazy and we're united in love. And he says that if we got this, and I just want to just imagine for one second, what would it be like if God had gathered 500 people, five or 600 people to be, I mean, around each other. You realize I'm talking about us, right? If God had gathered five or 600 people who called Journey Church home, probably more like eight or nine, because let's face it, we run five or 550 on a regular week, right? And let's face it, we're not the kind of church where everybody goes every week, right? So like, there's no telling how many people called Journey home, we just don't know. You can, it's like trying to count cats that are running around, you know? But, but the thing is that 
Think about this. Since God chose you, you and I, Journey Church, if God chose us to be holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourself. What would happen if we simply got a hold of tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, making allowance for each other's faults and forgive people who offend us? Well, what if we got that? I mean, what if we got it? What if we understood that? What if we talked to people? What if we were kind and gentle? What if we were compassionate? What if we were tenderhearted? That's crazy stuff. You want to talk about light in the darkness? It's unbelievable. Okay, time for a science lesson. I know it doesn't sound right, right? But I want to just... I, I, gotta, I have to pretend that I'm smart for at least one minute a year, okay? This is it, okay? So let me just, let me just take you back to high school chemistry maybe, okay? There, there's this philosophy called emergent theory. And emergent theory is really, it's probably best to just look at this word, okay? Let's look at an emergent property. Let's make it simple because I'm not going to get super good. And there's probably somebody in here who knows more about this than I do. In fact, there's probably a lot of you who read this and now know more about it than I do, okay? So, but, it's, but basically an emergent property is this. It's a singular property that is not the property of any component of the system, but it is still a feature of the system as a whole, okay? Let me illustrate it for you. You encounter this every single day and you didn't even know it. I, for my whole life, I've been taking part in an emergent property and had no concept or clue. Water is it. Every single day you encounter water, whether you touch it, it touches you, or you drink it, or you put it in your food, or whatever. You encounter water every single day. And what is water? H2 what? H2O. Okay, we're going to work on this. It's two parts. Hydrogen. Some of you are like, what's the H? I don't remember what the H is. Okay. Like, and, and one part. Okay, so you got this. You guys are working this together. Now, if we were to take those apart, you got two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. I was going to do an experiment, and I told Bryce about it. And then when I got to the part where it could potentially explode, he was a lot less excited about it, which was the whole freaking reason I wanted to do it, okay? Like, <laughs> so I'm like, it could explode, and it would be so awesome if it exploded. But, because then it's burned in the hydrogen. Anyways, forget it. But, so you got two hydrogen atoms. Is it atoms, right? Am I getting that right? And then one oxygen atom over here. The hydrogen atoms, if you cool them, they become, they become less dense. Is it less dense or more dense? I think it's less dense. They become less dense, okay? You become less dense as you cool them. In oxygen, if you cool it, it becomes less dense as you cool it. As you, as you cool oxygen by itself, it becomes less dense. But if you put those together and you cool water, what does it do? It becomes more dense. Isn't that crazy? This is, this is an emergent property. It wasn't present in either of the other two, but it's present when you put it together. And what that tells us, it's like, it's really amazing. Aristotle said it way before we knew all this stuff about atoms and stuff. He said, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Like, and it's the same thing Paul's saying back here in this whole thing. If we could get a hold of this, not if you could get a hold of it or if I could get a hold of it, but if we got a hold of it and then we put it together, what we could accomplish is so much bigger, right? And that's what it really comes down to for us. It's not about water. It's not about Aristotle. It's about what we can accomplish together is far greater than the total of what we could accomplish individually alone. What would happen if we got a hold of it? What if we understood tenderhearted mercy? What if we understood kindness and compassion? What if we understood forgiving? What if we just understood making room for other people's faults? The church would be an immensely different place if we just gave people room to try and not make it. <laughs> We're terrible at that. Not just us, everybody. Now here's the deal. We gotta figure out something. We're like, what do we gotta do about this? I don't know how to do this. I wanna do it, right? We all wanna do it. Then in chapter four, we flip the pages and we get to chapter four. And there's this verse that kind of pops out all of a sudden. It says this, live wisely among those who are unbelievers, who are not believers. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Now here's the deal. When you talk about people who are not believers and you talk about living wisely, I grew up in church, right? I grew up in church. I was born in church. It made the janitor furious. Get what I'm saying? Okay, got it. All right. So, like, it's a big deal. So, I, I've been in church my whole life. I've heard this talked on over and over and over again. And we have this common problem that we generally have when we talk about living wisely among unbelievers. I was told that that meant you had to cut your hair a certain length. 
It was the 80s when long hair was cool. That you had to cut your hair a certain length, you had to look like this way, and you couldn't do these things, and you couldn't listen to these, this music, and you couldn't go to those places, and you couldn't drink these liquids, and you couldn't do this stuff, and all this stuff. There's all these things you couldn't do, and you should do just these things, and people should see you from a million miles away and know that you're a Christian because you look like a lunatic, right? So, so here's the deal, like, and you had like this polyester suit on, the whole deal, and like that's how most people, I want you to know something. I get it. Because as a pastor, as I, as I talk about this, I was telling Sheila last night, I'm like, man, as a pastor, I just want to tell you, just do this and shut up. Please just do the right things and stop doing the wrong things and, and just be good. Would you just be good? It'd be a lot easier for me if everybody just be good. But what he's saying here isn't be good. He says, be wise. Now, here's the deal. I want you to get something. If you, like me, grew up in that and you're like, well, I kind of see the tension. I kind of see the reasoning behind that. Understand something. You will never attract anyone to Jesus by your holier-than-thou religion. I'm, I'm, let me unpack it before you get either too excited or too mad, okay? You will never attract anyone to Jesus with your holier-than-thou religion. People might find your religion. They might be attracted to your religion. They might be attracted to your structure. They might be attracted to your rules. They might be attracted to your look, but they will never be attracted to Jesus. And they will never find Jesus in your holier than thou religion. It won't happen because Jesus said that religion is like a whitewashed tomb. It's been painted on the outside and it looks really good, but when you roll the rock away and walk inside, it's death inside. That's what religion is. Religion is death every time. You will never attract anyone to Jesus with your holier-than-thou religion. So we kind of just tend to buck that one, right? We push away. I'm not religious. I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and I'm going I'm to run to the other extreme. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sin boldly. I'm just going to be all about it. And, man, people are going to see that I can party like them, and I can be like them, and hang with them, and do the things they do. I don't have to worry about it. And they'll be attracted to Jesus because I'm just like them. But I want you to understand something. And just as clearly as we said that, you will never attract anyone to Jesus with unrepentant sin. You can't do it. It's not possible. It'd be like trying to attract people to go out of Beale Street with country music. It doesn't work, right? So like, it's because it doesn't happen that way. People might like you. They might find you. They might know the name of Jesus. They might, they might like your bumper stickers. They might even like a song you played while you were doing that, right? You might understand, they might understand all that stuff, but they will never find the person of Jesus at work in your unrepentant sin because he's not there any more than he was in the religion. He's not in our unrepentant sin and he's not in our religion. Jesus is at work in this messy middle part that's so terribly difficult to manage and work and and allow him. And here's what he means by be wise, is to be intentional. It's about inviting people into your brokenness and living in this mess. This world is not easy to live in, is it? It's terribly difficult. I don't, don't, it's so tense. And it's so easy to run to one extreme and be like, well, we look like this and we go over here and we live in our ivory castles and we throw rocks at those people down there, right? It's easy to think that we're holier than thou. And it's easy to run to the bottom of the valley and go, look, I'm just down here with the people and you can't tell the difference. It's tough to hold a position on the side. The middle is very messy, but understand something. Did it just get different? My ear changed. Whew, that was weird. I literally can't hear out of this ear all of a sudden. So... That is awkward, okay? <laughs> it's difficult, because, but here's the deal. Jesus isn't in either of those extremes. Jesus is at work in the middle. Jesus is at work in people's lives. So if you want to be wise about this, invite them into your brokenness. If you want to, you want to be wise about what God's doing in your life and share that with people, you want to be wise about living among unbelievers. Don't run to the high mountains and throw rocks at, the, at those people and don't run to the bottom and be unrepentant. Invite them into your brokenness and share it with them. Be open-handed. Be intentional. We spend a lot of time at, these days at ball fields. Now, my daughter didn't play softball. My daughter plays soccer. She's been playing soccer since she was in kindergarten. And she's killed, ever since she was a little kid, you could just tell that she was going to be good at soccer. She, like, 
at five years old was over the ball and the way she should be. And you could just tell it. She always was going to love it. And so we've been a lot of time since she was little, she's 18, on a soccer field. Early on, I started yelling at the referees. You know, like when they were, at, when she was like in, you know, have you ever coached like, like little kid, five-year-old soccer? And you're like, they're trying to kick the ball and you're trying to see if their parents are looking so you can kick them. You know, like, like, and I'm yelling at the refs, ref, she's fouling. They're like, she's picking flowers. You know, like, how can, you know, so I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm super vocal. And, uh, but I realized about a year ago that um, this was like, I don't know if you guys have recognized this or not. I have a really, really big mouth and a really, really small filter. Okay. So they don't fit each other. The filter gets lost and then the big mouth just shows up. And what I realized about a year ago um, was that I wasn't trying to prove something to the ref. I was really just trying to prove something to me. It's my brokenness. It's my story. It's my mess. And so um, I sat the girls down and I said, girls, I've just, just, I just want you to know this is something God's been kind of showing me is that um, I've been a real, let's go with jerk. And uh, like, and uh, you know, I've just not been very kind. I've not been very compassionate. And, and it's not just that, it's that I'm not saying this to refs because they're that wrong or they don't see it. I'm just really saying it. It's really just compensating for my own mess and my own story. So yesterday, um, we spent this weekend in Cordova at a tournament, three back-to-back games in the heat, really tough for a recovering referee screaming, okay? So like, I'm, I'm struggling, right? And then like in the third game, I've been doing pretty good for two whole games. It's freaking hot outside. I'm sweating at the fat boy rag and I'm ripping my head off and the whole deal, you know? And so, so I'm out there and, and, the, and this is a particularly physical game. And, and my daughter's not a real big kid, you know? And so these girls like, I mean, elbowing her and, and the refs, I'm, apparently was reading a book or something and, and I'm, he's not seeing anything and calling stuff. And I may have lost it, I don't know, six, eight times, something like that, and in the first half. And then, but like, I just, you know, but I had already told these parents, I'm like, look, I've just been really working on this. It's not that I'm just like, throw it away, who cares? And I just do what I want to do. And it's not that I got to go over here and seclude myself from everybody else and, you know, fold my hands in prayer and pray that he sees it. It's that I invite them into my brokenness. And then I, I'm like, hey, you know, that, that's a good call, you know, trying to be humble, trying to walk through it, trying to be honest about how hard it is to shut up, how hard it is to not try and prove something to him or that I'm really proving something to myself. And how to, it's just tough. And it's hard to apologize to your kid when you act like an idiot, you know? I'm sorry I embarrassed you. But here's the deal. When we live wisely among people who don't yet believe, right? It's just inviting them into our brokenness, into our story and saying, look, God's working in my life. Here's the deal. He'll never, we'll never introduce somebody to religion and find Jesus at work there. That's not where he's at work. We'll never invite Jesus and invite people into our unrepentant sin and find Jesus at work because he doesn't work in our unrepentant sin. Where does he work? In the middle, in the mess, in the middle of our mess, right? Inviting them into our mess with gentleness and tenderness and kindness to other people. It also just means being okay with the fact that not everyone around us, including ourselves, is okay. Be okay with not being okay. I know that's hard to tell religious people, right? It's okay to not be okay. And it's okay for other people to not be okay. I had a conversation with a, um, a friend who's gay and, uh, and she'd recently broken up with her partner and they'd been together a long time. And we had a conversation and I just, you know, just in the conversation, she knows enough about me, enough about us, enough about our story and all this stuff. She knows that we can't agree on everything. I said, hey, look, um, we don't have to agree on everything for me to know that what you're going through is terribly difficult for you. And I'm very sorry you have to go through that kind of pain. But wait a second, um, aren't you kind of endorsing and this, you know, shut up, right? I mean, this isn't where Jesus is at work. Well, whatever I want to do, he's not, he's at work in the messy parts. It's not easy. Is it simple? No, I wish it was simple. I really honestly do. I even wish getting out of this point was simple. Like, it's just not, there's just nothing simple about it. Life is messy, and we have to work with people, because that's one of the most beautiful prepositions ever, isn't it? With, <laughs> because 
God came to be with us. Like, that's what Emmanuel means. God with us in our mess. Some people could have criticized him. In fact, they did. Aren't you endorsing and shut up? Give me a break. He came to be with us, to redeem us. It's one of the most beautiful things I think that, that Billy Graham ever said. I mean, you're talking about a guy whose life lived in crazy amounts of integrity, right? Said unbelievably powerful things. One of the most beautiful things that I think Billy Graham ever said was that it's God's job to judge. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. And it's our job to love, to clothe ourselves with love, to put on loving kindness and tenderness and gentleness and compassion, and to love people and make room for their faults, not to accept and go, oh, don't worry, do whatever you want to do. It's okay. Jesus isn't at work over there either. He's at work in the middle where it's messy. But think about something. What would happen if we understood it? We wouldn't be light in the darkness if in our religion, because that's just not, there's no light in the religion darkness, right? And there's no light in our just darkness. The only way to be light in the darkness is to be light in the darkness, is to really actually be, let God be at work in us while we work alongside of people, who, some of whom we agree with and many of whom we don't. It's a beautiful thing. So just, here's what he means by be wise. Be intentional. Be intentional about inviting people in to your mess, which means you have to be aware of your mess. You have to be aware of where your stuff stinks. I'm sorry, I'll get fired up about this stuff. Like you have to be aware of where your brokenness is and allow Jesus to work on your brokenness and then invite people into it. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's very difficult, which is probably why people run to the extremes. Because it's much easier to be religious or be unrepentant. So here's the thing. Be intentional about it. And then he says this in the next verse when I find it. Um, he says, you must, well, that's a different path, chapter, five and six. Yeah, it goes. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive. If you're going to be in, intentional about it, and you're going to look for a next step out of that. I want to ask you this question. Who are you investing in? Who is it that you're investing in? Like, is it your brother, a friend at work, a guy you know? Because most of us, once we become a Christian, we get committed to church, we get rolling, right? We lose all contact with people who don't look like us and act like us. And How many people who are far from God do you know? Let me just ask you that super simple question. God has placed you into their lives for a purpose. So step into their life and invest. Be intentional. Invite them over. Love on them. Care about them. Their brokenness is not going to rub off on you any more than your brokenness is going to rub off on them. It's okay to be friends with people you disagree with. Be kind and invest in them. But then it goes on. He says to let, to be kind to them. Just like let your, your, your conversations with them just be full of kindness and love and generosity and, and just transparency inviting them in. And then as you invest in them, let your invitation lead, or let your investment lead to an invitation. It's that simple. Now we believe, I believe the very best way to reach brokenness outside of these walls is to invest in people's lives and invite them to be a part of this. Why do I believe that? Because we live in the messy middle. If we were a super religious church, I'd be like, invest in them and take them somewhere else, right? Or if we were a, a church where it's like, oh, it's okay to do whatever you want to do. We don't even care anymore. I'd just say, hey, look, you got to figure out some way to be light in their life. But I believe that since we live in the messy middle and it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to be okay with not being okay, then when you invest in someone's life, the very best thing you can do is bring them here with you and we can help you together help your friend your brother your sister your aunt the guy at work whoever take their next step toward jesus so you want a next step invest in someone's life and invite them and let us participate with you not us the church journey and the organization and the staff and the elders and all these other people us these people sitting around you and the people who have lake places too like what we love you and we want to help you help them take their next step toward jesus it's a huge thing. You want to participate? Man, this is so huge. I, I can't even tell you how valuable this is. Don't let this be a weekend thing for you. 
Let this be an invitation into your life thing. Take your next step toward Jesus. Invite people into your brokenness. Be a part of Celebrate Recover on Thursday nights. We love it. It's powerful stuff. People's lives being changed. You're going to hear more about that in a couple weeks. I don't want to blow my mind. But man, unbelievable stuff God's doing around there. It's huge. You want to be a part of stuff? Invite Our kids' ministry desperately needs more workers, people who are going to be willing to kneel down and invest in a kid's life, build a relationship with them, care about them. By our junior high and high school ministry, I went last Wednesday night to our parents' night. We had a parents' open house thing, and, and I showed up, and I already know these people because I don't know if you know this, but I'm the pastor here, and so I know all of our leaders already, and I also know them because they've been in my kids' lives for a long time. And so I walk up, and they cheesy hand me their little business card, and you know, like, hey, I'm your kid's small group leader. I'm like, I know, you've been at my house. And you know, like, so we're hanging out with them and talking, and, but I'm just so amazed and blown away by these people who've walked with my girls as they've grown older. You know, as they, they're like, if you enter in a sixth grade, you walk up with your kids. So if you started leading a small group in sixth grade, and when they go to second, seventh grade next year, you walk with those same kids in seventh grade. You walk, walk with them in their eighth graders. And then when, when one of my daughters accepted Jesus, she's like, she's starting to figure out how is it we can have my small group leader in, as a part of my baptism. I'm like, this is huge. Blows my mind. It's unbelievable to me. There are fantastic ways. Not just to serve and volunteer and check it off my list and do my religious nature, because God's not at work in your religion. God's at work in us working in the messy middle. You have what it takes to invest in people's lives. So you want your next step? Invest, invite, get involved. Stop out at the connection table. I mean that because what you're doing out there isn't just filling a spot, isn't just doing a task. It's not just checking a box. It's changing lives. It's huge, and I mean that. What would happen if we, what, if, what would happen if just, just five or 600 people understood that we are united under one authority? What if we, if just five or 600 people could figure out that we were united together in our freedom what if you and I, what if we were understood? What if this five or 600 people understood what it looked like to step out and be kind and gentle and compassionate and loving and make room for other people's faults because we're united in our love? What if we as followers of Jesus, what if just this five, I don't even care about those people out there. What if five or 600 people understood what it meant to live in the messy middle and invite people in and invest in their life? What if we understood what it meant to give our time, because, not because it matters to the church, but because it matters to mission? You and I are united under mission. The question isn't, what does this do for me, or does it fit in my schedule, or can I work it in, or whatever. It's how can I not be compassionate and loving and be a part of what God's doing? I want to tell you something. There are a lot of ways to serve. I promise you this. There is none better than right here. Because this matters. Because it's unique. It's different. Not it's different from those. I just feel like God's at work in the messy middle. It's not easy. It's not simple. And it won't fit in your schedule. It shouldn't. Because it's a sacrifice. And the enemy doesn't want you to do it. If it was easy... Everyone would do it, and the enemy's not against that. Everybody does that stuff. Invest in someone's life and invite them to be a part and get involved. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're just thankful that you've united us. But it's not just about us. Um, it's not just about this group of people looking at each other and being thankful for each other. It's not just about getting involved and doing something to serve a bigger cause. We're thankful that you called us to one mission, to love people. And Jesus, we, we don't know how to do that all the time. We get lost in it. And we can't figure out the right ways to act in certain things. And we choose a side and then we work it out. And just, it's just so messy. But we're thankful to be a part of the mess that you're working in. And uh, that's powerful to us. So God, we just ask that... Um, the folks in this room, as we evaluate our relationships, our time, our investments, our, our involvement, that you would um, make it obvious to us how you'd have us to take a next step out of here today. I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just convict our hearts of how we can be involved in what you're doing and helping people not find our religion or find our mess, but find you.